Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If I can have your attention, please. Um, welcome to the Hendrik de Waard Lecture 2013. It's good to see all of you here. To introduce myself, I'm Kein Penevenzeel, and I'm president of the board of the Hendrik de Waard Foundation. Um, this lecture is organized by the Hendrik de Waard Foundation in cooperation with uh, Studium Generale Groningen and uh, Science Links. And I think you'll be on the edge of your seats tonight because our speaker has a very fascinating story to tell, ranging from dark military applications to uh, fundamental philosophical questions. Uh, to be honest, I'm a bit tired myself. Like, uh, for those um, who uh, are not um, into Groninger student life, Wednesday evening is student associations evening, so bars and cafes for all evening. And yesterday I was going out to that beautiful smart girl and uh, um, we had a drink in the, the Three Sisters being one of the big cafes in Groningen. And we laughed and we talked and we went to another place and we drank and she has a very attractive smile. And we went to another place and before I realized it was three o'clock and since I have to be here sharp this evening, um, well, I cycled her home and while she locked her bike, she looked back, beautiful smile, and uh, we looked each other in the eyes, and then comes that moment, does she ask you in for a cup of coffee? Now, of course, the coffee has nothing to do with the coffee. She could have asked me in for a glass of wine, for um, a midnight snack, or even to admire that beautiful dress she recently bought. And it reveals one of the fascinating, but also difficult parts of human language. Words can have several different meanings, and it is this what makes it very difficult for computers to analyze it. Um, because if a computer would have like filmed this moment of me cycling her home and she inviting me for a cup of coffee, the, probably, the computer would probably just analyze this under coffee, which of course is not what this is about. <laughs> so, um, um, computers, uh, 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 suppose a computer like would understand human language, consider the advantages. Consider that you could just talk to Google like instead of searching and um, um, it gives you directly exactly what you're searching for. Or you say to a computer, computer, I want to report about this and this, and it writes it for you. You can hand it into your boss. Um, or even like you are on the internet forum and um, the computer analyzes what the forum is about. That might be useful for security, like if there are some radicalizing people there. Um, and because of all those advantages, like research for the last years, uh, decades, actually try to learn computers human language. And it is a tremendous task. but. Uh, big steps have been made. And one of the principal researchers in this field is Professor Eduard Hovey, our speaker for tonight. In the interconnectedness of all things, actually, um, one of the students of Professor Hovey happens also to be the daughter of Paula and Henrik de Waard. Um, and that's Anita de Waard. And I'd like to give the floor to her to introduce Professor Hovey further. Thank you very much. Wow, this is an interesting microphone. So, um, it's a tremendous pleasure and an honor, and I have to say, I asked Kaan if I could do this introduction, because if you know me, then you've probably heard me gush about Ed Hovey, and uh, <laughs> my family said, is this man actually real? So, um, <laughs> in fact, there's many ways in which you could introduce Ed. You could say he's a famous scholar, uh, which is true. If you go anywhere in computer science, then almost every field you find some early papers by Ed Hovey. So, it looks as if he just has a question and writes some seminal papers, and then he gets bored and other people finish the field. This is kind of what it looks like. But you could also say, no, he's mostly a great mentor. And if you are one of the lucky people who are his mentees, you think you feel very singled out and you feel very special. And um, there's both a kindness and a ruthlessness. And the kindness is ruthless and the ruthlessness is kind, in which you are uh, mentored and uh, kind of brought up to the level um, that you try to try to be, you can be, and then you find out he has tons of students everywhere. So you feel singled out, but actually it's a great, great group of people who he's mentored. But um, I've worked also with Ed in the context of work within Elsevier, um, and then you could say, no, he's a, he's a brilliant diplomat, because we have some issues in Elsevier that you might know about with open access and not open access. And uh, actually, Ed negotiated a truce between the hardcore Elsevier lawyers and the radical open access fundamentalists, and this is a great act of diplomacy. But none of those really are what I would like to say. So <laughs> I thought, all right, I can figure out four words that kind of describe um, what I think are the, 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 what I'd like to say. And three of the words are nouns, so teaching, science, language, and then I thought, well, we need some kind of modifier, and that's beautiful. 
um, and it's a word Ed uses a lot. So he uses beautiful language to teach science, um, and it's one of the people whose papers I've read that if you read his scientific papers, they really make you laugh out loud and, and make you marvel at uh, the nice language in which they're written. But he also uses science to learn about beautiful language. So he approaches things like poetry and, and things like that with a very scientific focus. Um, and lastly, he does beautiful science on learning uh, by reading, and that's what this talk is going to be about. So I'm sure you'll have a wonderful evening, and uh, with great pleasure, I then hand the floor to Ed. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. So, Anita and Mrs. Devart, first of all, and the whole Devart family and everybody, thank you for coming. I feel so... Um, embarrassed now after all these words I think I'd really rather go and sit down and have a glass of wine with you because it, it is a little intimidating to be in this audience tonight in this in this forum tonight and to talk so I thought let's do the following I'll tell you a little bit about what inspires me to do this research in language and then you'll tell me when to stop okay so if it gets to be too boring or too slow or you start yawning or something, then just say, it's enough, okay? And then I stop. I'm happy to stop. I'd much rather talk with you about the, be the beautiful things, Anita, that language is, the thing that language is, and how we use it to communicate and to learn about one another. One-on-one, uh, -on -one, it's much nicer than having just one-way communication. Okay? Is that all right? Yes? Okay. So it is my great honor, great honor to be here tonight in memory of Professor Hendrik de Waar. My middle name is Hendrik. My grandfather was Amsterdammer. I speak also a bit in Netherlands, but not always good. I come actually from Johannesburg. And I would, I would like to sort of dedicate this in the spirit of what I've heard about this man. In particular, that he was a scientist. He wasn't a bullshitter. He didn't take nonsense. You had to prove your story. Now, the reason I started doing this field, I'd like to tell you, is as a personal anecdote, I, my, my grandfather, an Amsterdammer, was neither Deutsch gereformeerd, which means you don't play cards in my house, and you don't, you know, you go to church in certain ways and so on. And he had a very strict belief about what is right and what is wrong and how God works and so forth. My mother was Swiss and she was a Christian scientist who believes that God is everything, God is love, God is not physical. Therefore, there cannot be anything that is not love and that is physical, that's just an illusion. So you yourself are a combination of abstract characteristics like love and joy and humor and beauty and enjoyment of music and so on. And each person is a different combination of these things. And so you, don't, you should not concentrate on the bad and the sin and stuff because that really doesn't exist. My father was an engineer, a scientist, an agnostic. He was like Hendrik de Waard, I think. And he said, prove it. Prove it. And one day we're sitting, I'm 12, and we're sitting at dinner, and my grandfather says, we should read the Bible after dinner. And my father says, why? And we don't want to read the Bible. We want to go and play cards. So we're already moving away. My mother says, stop. You listen to the Bible. And then my grandfather starts opening a place, and he starts reading something about sin and the devil. And my mother says, that's not real. This is just metaphorical language. And my grandfather says, it's in the Bible. And then they start a fight. And so now we're looking at the opportunity to slip out, and then my father says, stop all this stuff. It's not important because nobody can define the terms that you're talking about. You cannot define God or, or, or truth or real or something like this in ways that are empirically, scientifically motivated. And therefore, you really can have this debate, but you shouldn't subject the children to your own internal debate before you've decided on your policy. Go, children. Boom, we're gone. And I remember the relief at being able to go and the question that stuck with me is like, well, if this side says there is a God and a devil and a body and sin, and this side says this, none of that is real, it's all an illusion, and it's just sort of an artifact of your mind, and really you are beauty and harmony and poetry, and this side says you don't know what the hell you are, you can't even prove it, what's the truth? How must I act as a responsible person in my life? How must I judge? How must I guide myself? What must I tell my children? So I decided I'm going to learn mathematics. 
that's the truth, right? <laughs> so I went to university and I, I did four years of mathematics and at the end I discovered there are all these people called intuitionists and other things and there's big fights from Russell to others in mathematics about what is mathematical truth and that's not really a very well-defined concept either. So I said, let me do philosophy. And I read some philosophy and that, who knows what that is. And I read some psychology. And eventually it seemed to me, the place you want to go, the place that I think makes the most sense for me to go, is to go and look inside artificial intelligence. I loved programming. And if I could create an artificial soul, an artificial person, that would actually mirror, in some ways, the intelligence that, that I see in people, but I can open the computer and look inside, I would be able to say, oh, this thing and that thing comes from this little rule and that little data structure and this little procedure. Then I would be able to go, and at that point, Thomas Aquinas was one of my heroes because he, he really studied this problem of the soul and, the, and, and the, the body and how different combinations of features embody the, how the soul sort of inhabits the body and gives it life and, and, and spirit and a reality. And I thought, maybe I can do that to a computer. Wouldn't that be cool? Now, of course, <laughs> you know, that's the dream that every young, arrogant person has here. But I did use that as my guiding light when I went to graduate school. And eventually, I sat and I studied language, human language, because I think it's a wonderful window into your mind. All of us speak language, at least one, right? And all of us know that language reflects something about us. But let me ask you a question. How many words do you know of Dutch? Hello. <laughs> How many words do you know? 10,000. 10, Any other guesses? Anybody say 11? 1150? 1200? Let's, let's do an auction. So you don't know how many words you know, right? Yet you use words ever since you're three, and you're an expert in your language, are you not? How many grammar rules do you know? Do you know that people don't even know how to count how many grammar rules exist? No? <laughs> if you go to a dictionary tonight and you look, take the big fandala or something and look in the front where it says, this dictionary has so many th tens of thousands of words, and open anywhere and just count. Oh, I know 80% of this. Open again. Oh, I know 75%. Oh, you'll be able to work out how many words you know of Dutch. And it will be not counting names, just normal words, not counting verbeugen, just normal words. It will be around about, I don't know, 70,000 to 80,000 words of Dutch. No? And then you add the other languages. Now, if you, if you look how children learn, if you take the number of days a child is alive from the age of zero to the age of about 20, and you say they learn by the end of this 80,000 words, you'll see children learn between 9 and 11 words per day on average. Per day on average, your child, you, learned 9 new words over 20 years. <laughs> this doesn't astound you? Yes, it does. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Did you think that you were learning nine new words every day for 20 years? And sometimes, of course, you didn't learn any. The other day, you were learning 18 words. That's phenomenal. Your brain is an amazing thing. And you use those words without thought in the right time, in the right place. And you use them in such combinations that they, discover, they, they give away who you are. They tell things about you. What are you interested in? What are you excited about? Who are you? How angry are you? How formal are you, etc. This is a phenomenal thing. This is a beautiful thing, to use Anita's word, right? So now let's see. Let's see if we can actually make a computer do something with language, OK? Shall we try that? And when you get tired, you tell me, stop now, that's enough, and then we stop, OK? I'm happy to come back next year if you want and tell you more. <laughs> Believe me. All right. So let's see if we open the brain. Let's go look inside those little gear, gears and wheels and things. So the field I represent is called natural language processing, or sometimes computational linguistics, or sometimes human language technology. Artificial intelligence people use the first one. Linguists use the second one. Sort of technology Google type people use the third one. And it's an intersection of sort of several areas like psychology and linguistics and computer science and a bit of neuroscience and uh, neurolinguistics and psycholinguistics. And it's a fascinating place to play because you can touch all these different fields in a little bit of way and you have some philosophy on top on the top there. Now, if you want to build a language machine, what do you need? Hello, what do you need? <laughs> words! Thank you very much. You need words. Yes. Okay, so here's a bunch of words. Is that enough? No, because you need to put them in order. 
right? And now you say suddenly that's English. The first was not English, it's just words. The second is English, yes? Why? Because it conforms to rules of grammar. Isn't that great? Fantastic. People have studied grammar for over 2,000 years and people believe they know it, but nobody can tell you how many rules of grammar there are not even for English. Nobody can tell you that. They've never built a full grammar of any language either. Is that enough? Context? No, context. Yes, we have translators here. They know exactly where I'm going, guys. <laughs> Perfect. You need the following. What's the difference between the first and the second sentence there? The second one has meaning. Now, if you use computer programs today, from Google to summarization system to speech recognition systems, you will know they work at that first level. They know something about how words should go in order. But you will also know they have no idea how to do that second level. They don't know what meaning is. And if you ask any child what's important about language, after they say a little thing, they come down to meaning is important. That's what I want to say. I don't care about making beautiful syntax. I want to make meaning with you. So if you want to make a computer do language, you have to do something about meaning. And all the rest of my talk is going to be about different ways of trying to put meaning into a computer, from old ways to new ways. Okay? All right. In addition to meaning, there is, of course, context. There is what's called pragmatics. I can give you the main meaning, but I can say it in a flowery way, or in a sour way, or in a formal way, or in a happy way, and all these extra little signals, like the small melody on top of the main theme, these are the extra things that give away who you are, and where you are, and how much time you have, and how noisy. That's called pragmatics. And I'm not going to talk about that. That's whole extra levels of representation. Let's just go look at this middle level called meaning. Now, in 1970s, when AI, artificial intelligence, started, there was a philosopher at MIT called Joseph Weizenbaum who said, huh, what do you mean artificial intelligence? That's complete nonsense. I can build a little computer program that can do language. Thank you very much. And he built a thing called ELISA, which you can go and look at those websites and others. And I can run it here, but it takes a little long to switch over. I'll just tell you what it does. And you, it comes there, and you can type to it. It just sits away. You type anything you like, and it pretends to be a therapist, and it asks you to reformulate what you say and ask you questions. And people can talk, and sometimes you can amuse yourself. But you, if you do the right sort of thing, you discover very quickly it's stupid. How does it work? It just has little patterns inside like this, and the number of patterns and the sophistication of the matching and the reformulation that you define, that gives you more and more and more apparently interesting behavior. It's got syntax, it knows how to make good sentences, uses English words, but it has no clue on semantics. It tricks you into trying to do semantics. In fact, I once gave this to one of my secretaries to play with, and I said, just talk to the singing chief for 25 minutes. And then she came back to me, she said, you know, that's okay, that computer, but it's kind of boring. I said, oh, really? You don't like Yeah, no, no, it understands me, and it's fun, and I like talking to it. I went to her screen, and I saw she told it all kinds of things when she went to the toilet, I'm afraid to admit. And I typed at the bottom, I think you're a nice person. She came back, she said, oh, the computer said something new. I said, what did it say? She said, it thinks I'm a nice person. I said, so? She said, it never says that sort of thing. I said, what do you mean? And she could not tell me what she meant by that, but she clearly saw there was something different here. Right? So the, she, she was operating at meaning, but she was fooled by this thing. Right? So at some point it can fool people and not. There's something in there, you must not get fooled. Now let's first get some things out of the way and then we go into meaning. You can look at words and you discover words have different meanings. Right? A, sing, a word form on the top can have different meanings, so we must understand. We don't care about the word form, we must care about the word meaning. So we need to make something called mouse number one and mouse number two. And in there lies a big philosophical question, how many different kinds of flavors of each individual word there are. And there's a lot of, we can talk about that for hours. But there are ways if one can approximate this. Secondly, if we want to define an internal language of meaning, it's not enough just to have mouse number one and mouse number two. Just like we compose the English words into sentences, we need to compose these mental words, let's call them concepts, into sentences, forms, structures. Let's call them frames. And let's agree that we can write the frames this way, which is one of the two traditional ways of writing them. There is some kind of rat, right? Uh, some kind of eat, excuse me. And it is its agent, the eater, is mouse number one. And the thing it's eating, the patient, is cheese number one, a certain kind of cheese. Right? Let's imagine we make a little language of boxes like this. We're going to play a game with this soon. 
And imagine now we have to compose these things because we know thoughts can compose and the compositionality of semantics is a core part of the meaning of how you make big meanings out of small little pieces there. We should be able to take this little mouse and take open its little box and put more information inside of it, just like this. And then we can say, we can build very big network structures like this. And inside we put all these mouse number one and we define them in our little dictionary somewhere. Okay, that's the game we have to play. And we must define how, how many agent and patient and location and all the little roles we have to define. So our question is, if we want to build a language of thought that we can represent in the computer that sits behind the words, Let's see if we can do something like this. And it doesn't matter if you speak German or Chinese or English, you have the same sort of thing inside there. You just have different words on the outside for that. Okay? So the primitivity problem you can call becomes a rather important one. How many of these little symbols do you have? You could not tell me how many words you know. Can you tell me any how many concepts you know? Hmm? That's a little bit harder, right? Because you have all these emotions for which there are no words, but you feel them and they're different, right? And, and what poetry evokes in you and what music evokes in you and complexities of, of, of a situation and things for which there are no words, but the concept is real and you feel it, right? So it's very much harder to estimate. I don't think you can put an easy number and it's been hard to think of ways in which you can possibly estimate upper bounds for the number of clearly differential, different, differentiated concepts that you have. But it's clearly more than, let's say, 100,000. Let's say it's a billion, okay? 10 times or something like that. So pe some people have argued that it's too hard to try to enumerate each concept. What you must rather do is make a few primitive ones, and out of these you can compose more complex ones. And then if you have a good building block system, like big Lego, you can make a big cathedral out of a small Lego block. You just put it together. Other people have said, no, 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 I'm just going to give a whole bunch of symbols. So. One of the people who said, let's go primitive and make a small number, was my advisor, Roger Shank, who is, uh, was a well-known person, a controversial person. Some people hate him and some people admire him. And his idea was, we have a certain alphabet, a certain vocabulary of object symbols, and a certain core vocabulary of event, verb, action type symbols, and then other things and rules for composing them. And then we, we now start building our meanings out of these things. So let's imagine we want to say that John gives Mary a book. So would you agree with me that this is an okay way to represent John gives Mary a book, where P trans means physical transfer. That means we've got a physical thing, it's being transferred from one to another. And all we need to know is who's the giver, who's the taker, and what's the thing that's being transferred. Okay? So now we have another thing. We say, well, if John gives Mary a book, then surely we can agree that now Mary has the book. Yes? So the possession went away from John and went to Mary. So we can make another primitive, which cannot be P-trans, so we have to make something called possess or something, where ownership is involved. And now we can say, well, if you have the book, then maybe you can sell it again. And maybe somebody can ask you for it. And maybe you can hide it and things. So we can make further steps, rules around this. And we can make, and if you say, well, you're allowed to give it to someone else, you can make P-trans on top of that to somebody else. So you can make lots and lots and lots of these things out of very simple sets of primitives with simple little rules. You can make something like this. John, Mary gave a book. Mary got a book from John, right? So is this different or the same? Hmm? Are these two representations different or the same? An interesting question, right? What does it quite mean, this thing? There's the physical transfer of the book from Mary to John, but somehow is John the agent or is Mary the agent? Right? How, how do you decide that? That becomes a little bit more subtle. Yes, so if, when you, as soon as you try to simplify the meaning into a simple little thing like this, a little calculus almost, a meaning like this, you deal with feelings, with questions that become very, very hard to, 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 to solidify and to describe, but they're real for you. You say, John gave Mary the book, or Mary took the book from John. The book still went from one to the other, but there's a focus difference that's very hard to capture there. So now we can do something else here, like, John donated a book to Mary, and somehow that's different from give. There's extra connotations. It's not so easy to know what that means. There's something about money inside. How about Mary bought a book from John? Can you, just, can you imagine what that would look like? It's a little representation. It's a little box. 
Two P-transits of the book and money in the opposite direction. Very nice. Right? You see the logic, right? You can go to any child and say, what does book, what does buy mean? I don't know the word buy. You say it's two P-transits. You give me the book, I give you the money. They say, ah, okay, that's it, right? So buy and sell and so on become this thing. Swap is a buy, except it's not money in the bottom. Suddenly, a whole lot of words fall together into one system. Isn't that nice? Isn't that great? That's actually quite fun. Now you can think about this possess, and you can say, maybe my dog knows about possess, because if I have the bone, it wants the bone, and then it possesses the bone, and it doesn't give the bone to someone else. These primitives are actually probably real also for some animals. Some of them, right? So it's a very interesting question. So let's take some sentences. On the right, we, give, we have the little list of primitives that he's allowed, he's given us, that we so can play with. Now we have John gives Mary a book we know. Mary gets a book from John we know. John buys a book from Mary. That's the double thing. How about John gives Mary a kiss? Is that a P-trans? No, of course not, because it's not a physical kiss. So what is this primitive here? So will A trans is abstract transfer of like ownership of something, M trans is information, mental transfer of something like this, M build is conceptualize or think, move is to move your body, and so on, grasp something, push something, attend to something, do something general, and so forth, cause something. So John giving Mary a kiss is actually quite a complicated thing, right? There's a movement of John to Mary and the lips pucker a certain way and do a certain sucking thing and all kind of stuff and, right? It becomes not so easy to go and say what is kiss. John gives Mary a headache, you know? He gives her a kiss and now she's got a headache. This bloody John is a nuisance, right? As so, as so many of us have realized. And so then John gives Mary a headache. Now what does that mean, right? So. How do you represent a headache? You need a different set of primitives now about head and positive state plus five and negative state minus five, that's a headache, and minus eight is a big headache, and minus ten is a migraine, you know, you can imagine it, right? So Mary, of course, has the headache, so she gives him a black eye. So what does that mean, right? Mary did something, a do, with the result that the state of John's eye goes to minus five, <laughs> right? No? But you can see the simplicity of it, but also the logic of it. Is that such a, something appealing to be able to take the basic meanings and decompose them into a primitive system and play with it? And that's the beauty of trying to do this sort of semantics. Because out of that, you can then make programs give you a summarization. If you can make a computer program take the text in and make that thing, then you can go out into a different language that's called machine translation. You can take a complex set of these things, find the central ones, the most connected ones, pull only that out and give that, and that's called text summarization. Right? You can do lots of interesting things if you could do this. No? And a lot of people have now been trying that. John gives Mary a lift. That's a whole different thing there. So just the word give, you'll discover, has almost no meaning. It can mean anything. The word do has absolutely no meaning. It can mean everything. Right? So there's actually quite a lot of games here. And so I just have this slide to remind me to tell you one or two stories about some programs that were built in the 1970s and 80s using the system. One was to generate stories about little bears that do things and animals that barter and stuff. Another one was my own thesis work, Pauline, that tried to tell the same story, a network of about 100 of these structures in different contexts to different people. And I once set it to speak to an antagonistic person on a topic that was very strongly opinionated one side or the other, and the program had one set of sympathies, the hearer had a different set of sympathies, there was no time available, etc., etc., and the program said nothing. And I thought there was a mistake, and I spent 45 minutes debugging the program step by step, saying, I tell you, say this little box. So he takes the little box and says, well, this box has connotation negative for me and positive for him, or no, positive for me, negative for him, and he's antagonistic to me, and I can't say, I better find another positive thing and balance it. So although bad thing, still good thing, and he won't be so angry with me, but then I need to find a good thing. But now I'm under time pressure. He's waiting for me, so I must quickly find in a close perimeter. I don't find a good thing. Maybe I can find inside here some words that are sort of hiding the fact that it's a bad thing or that he doesn't like. And it went through step by step. It was about 14,000 lines of code there. And it could not do anything. And eventually, it just chose to say nothing. This was a surprise to me. I didn't expect the computer program could choose to say nothing. I honestly thought it was making a mistake. So then I said, wow, isn't that great? This thing has done through simple sets of rules, operating on some, something that was actually clever that people would choose to do. 
So isn't this what Aquinas would say, is taking some complexity into some simple sets of mechanical things here on the computer, and through a combination doing something that, uh, there's no soul in this, but it's exhibiting a behavior that you would say is kind of intelligent or interesting? I still don't know quite how to interpret that, but that lesson stuck with me for, for until now, right? This I did 30 years ago as a graduate student. And I, I love programs that surprise me this way, that have a simplicity in them that out of the combinatorics of the simplicity give you a behavior that's more. Some people are in love with this, they call this emergence and all kinds of things. I don't go that far. I'm just looking for that to see if I can create that and understand how that works. That, I think, is one of the, the, the deepest uh, goals and searches that anybody can have if they want to understand how we work and are understandable to one another in a way that you can describe. If you say, no, it's all just complex in a big black box and say, okay, that's no description, but that may be the truth. But if you want to reduce it to some principles you can describe, you have to do something like create simplifications and create mental structures or something and show how they work. And then you have to look for the sort of surprise out of the combinatorics. Otherwise, there's no way, I think, that you can get something like intelligence. So that's sort of my life theme now. I'm looking to try to do simple work that out of the simplicity with combinatorics comes surprising complexity. And that's the rest of what I'd like to tell you about. Up to the end of the 1980s, most artificial intelligence and natural language processing work was done by people who had studied language, logic, linguistics, and built computer science rules, programs by hand with sort of sets of code. In the 1990s, late 1980s, a group at IBM, the same group that built the Watson question answering system, the same, not the same people, but the same sort of area, these people said, you know, language is so complicated and has so many thousands of words and things, there's no way any human being is going to write enough rules. If you cannot even tell me how many grammar rules you have, you don't have a hope. So they took machine learning algorithms from a different branch of computer science, learning to find correspondences automatically, and they built the first statistical machine translation systems. They took French, English, parliamentary record from Canada, and they said, you know, here's three million words of text on either side, and every time I find a sentence with the word dog on this side, I count the words on this side in all the sentences, there's dog here, and I find the, the sentences that translate, and I find the word chien is very often there, you know. Maybe chien is the dog word. And for not, I found ne and pas, equal likely, and so forth. And so they built a little correspondence table with statistics automatically. And then they built another little table that tells you which word goes first and second, and in context, what's the sort of words. And they built a very simple two-step machine translation system that looked to say, you give me all these words in English, I'm going to find word by word the, the other translation word in French. And now this bag of words, I'm going to find what's most likely first one. And if this is the first, what's the next one? And what's the next one? And they built the system. At the time, I saw it the first time in 1991, it ran on about 12 large computers, and it took three hours to translate a 10-word sentence. And they were proud of that. And today, the Google translation engine you use every day works on the, the descendant of that principle. These guys brought the statistics wars into my field, and they essentially, in five years, demolished everybody else. And they were aggressive and sort of humorous, too. And they essentially said, if you think you can write rules by hand, you're kidding yourself. You're a joke. You're a moron. Do it the statistical way, and it's easy. And so everyone since then has been doing machine learning and statistics to learn to do the, con the transformations, the correspondences. And that's actually been a very healthy thing for the field. They brought an empirical scientific methodology to to test what you do against large corporate, to see what do people do, what do machines do, how well can we do that. But they also lost something. They lost the ability to build simplifications, build abstractions like the little packet I show you. No computer can invent that packet out of statistics. And to be able to transform into this abstract packet and do things with that packet. And slowly now, some people are trying to bring that sort of abstraction and generalization and human in, in intuition into the statistics to see if we can build a new kind of language technology where you use the human's mind and linguistic knowledge and others to bring in the abstraction and then use the statistics to learn how to do that. That's what our field is all about today, and that's what I teach my students and what students all around the world are busy looking to learn. And that's a very interesting combination. There's a lot of dynamism and fun into, trying to, into doing these things. So let me tell you now how Google works, for instance, as an example, right? 
Here is a little text. You type the questions, you get the answers. So let's take the Wikipedia article on Thomas Aquinas. How can you build Google? Do you know how Google works? It's really very simple. No? Imagine you look at this article of Thomas Aquinas and you make a list of all the words that you see and you count how many times does each word go. So you get this little thing and you say there's the word the and the word to and the word of and the word summa and the word, you know, etc. And you see the numbers, the frequency, how many times you see the word. And if it's a plural, you drop the S and you make all the words nice and simple. Same form, same spelling. Yes? This thing you can put into a form they call the vector. Right, it's just a long, long list, and each, the first position is this one, the second, da 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 da, da. So you have maybe 240,000 positions, one for each word in your, in, your, in your lexicon. And in this word, position number 15, that's word the. And you say, oh, word the in this article is 75 times. And position number 394 is the word in, and oh, this one occurs 92 times. You can fill this very easily, right? You can imagine computing this. Now comes the next trick. You take this thing and you create what you call a vector space. This was done in the 1970s at Cornell University by Gerard Salton and his students. And you make one dimension for each word. There they are. And now you say, OK, I take this vector, and it gives me a number on each dimension, so I can make the spot. That's this document, right? It is so many thes, and so many ofs, and so many ins, and so many aquinases, and so many sumas, and all this kind of stuff. There it is, that unique. Now, there may be another document that happens to have the same numbers of words in all in balance. It's very unlikely, but it'll sit really next to that one, right? No? Good, you say. I make this document and I point him, I put that on that spot, I put a little address to this document. So if anybody can find that document, I can give them back this. If they can find that spot, I give them this document, right? Yes? Now, let's say I want to go to Groningen. So here's another information about going to Groningen. And I count its words and I go and put and I discover, whoa, this document is far away in that space. He's over here because he has a different balance of words. Yes? So now, when I go to Google today, now, Google goes and they, they have computers, large sets, hundreds of computers every day that read all the text they can on the web, count the words, create the little spots and make this little space full of spots. Full, full, full of spots. Always updating. Some update every day, some update every week, sometimes every month, sometimes every three months. I now go and I type in Groningen and Train University and things like this and there's this thing and it takes my few words and it says, well, from that query I get the words you want and I go to the space and I say, somewhere up here, he wants train words and Groningen words and university words, somewhere in this space, in this blue zone, that's what he wants. Let me find the one that's kind of central there, I'm going to give this to him. And if he doesn't like that, I'm going to find a little bit off. And you make this little space round and round and you have a number and that's how you get the Google ranking, right? And the is, isn't that simple? Isn't that easy? Once you know, you say, my God, that's all. And it's a lot of engineering to do that, but that's essentially what they do. No? And they do lots of engineering and try to find the closest ranking and the distance measures in this space and so forth. So when you do the query, you can get all this. And that's how Google works and all the other information retrieval engines. Machine translation is an old success story. I'm not going to say much about it. I'd like to show you one more or two more examples. But it works on similar sort of principles. I already told you about finding word correspondences and doing this now in a statistical way in the 1990s. Let's look at question answering. Do you know the, the system Watson that did question answering that uh, IBM built recently? And it beat the top television champion of answering questions. How did that system work? Well, let me tell you how it worked. Also very simple. Here was the final television thing. There's the world champion on the left side, Ken Jennings, and on the right side, another guy who won a lot of money on Google, and here's the system in the middle. And the IBM sort of people, they wanted to make a face and all this, and the computer builders, David Ferrucci and others, they said, under no circumstances will you personify this thing. There will be no face, and you will not have a fancy voice. You will have a real computer little voice like this. And so, so they actually had a big fight about this for eight months, and then they talked to Sony Pictures, who owns the television show, and there was a fight with the lawyers for two years until they had all the parameters just right so they could actually make the system run and do the program. It ran, as you see, on over I don't know, several thousand computers, all on stage behind there. It was not allowed to be touching the internet at all. And it took from two hours to answer a question down to three seconds through a lot of careful engineering. And the results were that it actually beat most of the humans. And the sort of questions they asked is in a stupid television format where they give you an answer and then you have to say the question word. It's just an inversion of the normal pattern. So on the right-hand side, for instance, 
for a thousand dollars of the four countries in the world that the US does not have diplomatic relations with, the one that's the furthest north, right? So you need to know four countries in the world that the US does not have diplomatic relations. You go to find out, case, North Korea and Cuba and da 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 da. Then you have to go second part, which one of these is the furthest north? And so, so you can see, you need to understand the question. You need to know something about diplomatic relations. And then you need to know something about latitude and longitude. Hmm? Okay, so already immediately you see, I'm going to need some specialized machines in there. One that knows about geographic space, and one that knows about diplomatic relations, and one that knows about questions and so forth. All right. If you look at how people play, and you draw the following kind of interesting graph, on the bottom axis, left to right, it says, how many questions did you answer in a particular game? Did you answer every question? Did you try to answer, or did you sometimes hold back and say, I don't know? More to the right means you answered everything you could get. More on the left means you, you were more conservative. On the up and down axis, y axis, how correct were you? So if you're really good, you answer all the questions, and you're correct all the time, you're up on the top right. If you're really conservative, you only answer a few, but you're always right, so you're sort of in the middle but high. If you're really just crazy, you answer everything, but you're often wrong. You're down on the right, but in the bottom, right? Those little dots there show where the best players sit. They're all up in the middle somewhere, and they're all, some are more conservative, some are more. The red dots are Ken Jennings, the top world champion. That's his dots. The brown line is where the computer was when it started in about 2002, 2003 or something, when they started building this thing. It was horrible. And the more they, they said, oh, you can answer anything you get, just take your best guess, the worse it got. So then they started building this machine, and you can see month by month by month, two month steps, three month steps, six month steps, how the system import, uh, quality improved, always sloping down to the right as it got more, less conservative, it made more mistakes. And pretty soon, after a few years, it started going up into the reach, range of Ken Jennings, and then they ran it, and they were really lucky that they actually beat Ken Jennings, because to do this test properly, they tell me you would have to do about 72 runs, 72 games, and then you would have a statistically trustworthy result, and under that is no way that the system would have beaten Ken Jennings. But it would have beaten everyone else they tried that they've ever seen, but not Ken Jennings, they say. So they were just lucky there, and of course, they're never, ever going to play the game again on television. <laughs> they can only lose. So how did it do this? Well, it had 104 modules inside. One module knew about space and time, and latitude, uh, latitude, longitude, and none. The module knew about space and things. And when I say know about, I mean it had rules to reason about using the kinds of packages that I, I showed you. So some modules took this question and broke it up into little pieces and built sort of packages like this, simple packages. And there was one module that went and did an information retrieval type retrieval against all of Wikipedia and about a thousand other texts that they had read and pull in like this. And then another module said, is this a space thing or is there a rhyme in here? And I must understand about phonetics and rhyming. Or is there something here about history that I need to know about dates and timelines, etc. Each module had its own specialization and then ran. Then there was a question of putting them all together in such a way that they could achieve different modules predict different things. You don't know which one's the best, so each module had to have a confidence value, and you had to integrate the confidence values into one overall value. So you had something that looked like this. First you go, and you go against all the text the system has read in a big vector space, and you find then all these answers there and you get a bunch of answers, then you run through all the different engines, and they each predict some more answers, and then you find some more ancillary evidence. If this were the answer, what else would be true, and bring that back. And you go from one question to hundreds of thousands of possible answers with numbers, and you re-rank them, and you get one little stack, and they show the top three guesses, and you get the numbers, and they played a long time to try to get good numbers that sort of usually give you the right results. And that's what eventually ran. So here's some question, for instance. Name the decade when Disneyland opened and the peace symbol was created. Watson did not just go and do a little Google type retrieval and get this. It looked for the peace symbol and opening and found a date there and said, oh, this, this sort of 1950 looks like this. And then when Disneyland opened and they found another date that looked like a year and said these two dates and then decade, the time reason the new decade means in some 10-year some period that starts with, you know, with a zero number on stuff. And eventually it had something like, well, here's the answer. 
it, and it was pretty confident. The strength was very green up there, and the others were really poor. And the, the little blue and red, red lines below show you the different modules. The top one is the type match, that is, that is a date kind of a thing. The second is the passage support, are the words around it okay? Next, the popularity score. Do many people text um, uh, give you the same information and word associations and things like this? Another question, U.S. cities, the largest airport is named for a World War II hero, the second largest for a World War II battle, and so Watson said Toronto, and that's actually wrong, it's Chicago, because it's U.S. cities. So what happened was one module knew about U.S. cities and made all these things, another module made World War II heroes and things and came up with Lester Pearson, which is the name of the airport in Toronto, and he was also a World War II hero. But these modules didn't talk to one another below, so the U.S. city model didn't stop the Lester Pearson thing come up, and so it made a mistake like this. And so you can see sometimes the thing is good and sometimes the thing is bad. Now here's another little story about dialogue engines and then we move very quickly, okay? Are you getting tired yet or is this okay? No, I'm just telling you little stories and later we're going to get to the lessons. Some colleagues of mine, when I was still at, at um, um, University of Southern California last year, before I moved to Pittsburgh, built a dialogue system for the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army has the following problem. It sends young men of the age of and young women, let's say between 25 and 30, into places like Iraq. And they have to deal with very complicated situations, and they're not especially smooth and intelligent and socially nice, as we know, right? So in this case, for instance, there was a Spanish doctor in the simulation on the left, and this village elder, an Iraqi, on the right. And your job, you are now the captain, you've got the headphones on, and you're, you're sitting in this room, and they're standing in the room, and there's a screen that's bigger than life size, about 120 degrees like this, and you talk to the screen, to these people, and they talk back to you, and inside is all this language technology, and your job is you must convince the Spanish doctor to move the hospital to a different place. Why? Because you want to bomb that place tomorrow, to this here where he's sitting. But if you tell him that, he's going to say, to hell with you, what do you mean, you American, you can't tell me where to go, this is Iraq, thank you. I'm going to stay right here because people know I'm here. So you have to do it somehow nicely, right? So how do you train the soldier to, to act nice? This is not the way American soldiers are trained to do, but the American army said we had better train our people to operate in the world properly, so they give this research institute millions of dollars over a 10-year period to create scenarios like this to help train their people to be socially just better. Isn't that amazing? Like, it blows my mind that this is what they do, but hey, if you'll take the money because you can do interesting research, right? So, okay. So behind this, you have to build all this language engine and things, but you need to do now a lot more. You need dialogue acts. He's asking me, he's ordering me, he's insulting me. What, and you have to say, he's looking at me, he's not looking at me. You need a whole lot of paralingual things, language plus more, in other words, to make it natural. This also has to be modeled because if the captain just says then, I think you're a wonderful person, please move your hospital, and he looks like he's insulting you, that's not going to work, right? So they have to model all this stuff together. So one of the things that, for instance, they do here is this, this simulation. Oh, I, the sound isn't working. The sound should be working here, where this little face, he, said, he looks to the left. Let me see if we can do it again. There. He's looking to the one side, he says, hello. And the guy says, hello, and he looks to the other side, and he says, hello. And automatic face tracking is just saying, where's he looking? And then the right person answers back. This sounds trivial, huh? But somebody had to build that, and they had to do face modeling and the box around, and where the eyes, and which way the eyes going, and so forth. So that's, that's just one of the little pieces. Then here's a news article, but I'm sorry, I can't. Maybe I can pull out this. Or... them to react to visual cues from humans. Can you hear? But coming from digital analysis of the video from six cameras, we were allowed to watch this first demonstration in a scenario with characters in a military negotiation. Yeah, if it doesn't matter, it's okay. Don't worry. The point is, this guy, David, is explaining, oh, let's skip over this. I'll tell you what it said. It's telling that when you point to someone, 
they now know not only where you're looking, but your finger is pointing, that's not polite in that culture, and then they complain about it and they don't listen. All the meters go down. He's pointing at me, Vap, I'm not going to work with him. So all this stuff had to be modeled as part of the language, and inside the system looked like this. You had this person speaking, which goes through a certain kind of speech recognition from sound waves into words, and then through this analysis with the words into these frames that I show, I'll show you in a second. Then it goes to dialogue where all this other stuff is happening and reasoning inside. Then it comes out to little packets like this, then goes to speech and goes through the words coming out. And all this complicated machinery was built, was supported by lexicons and dictionaries and, and little frame packet machines and things, hundreds of modules in there to make this artificial human work in this one tiny little scenario that lasts about three minutes. So you have the speech wave, which gets converted into a little frame like I showed you, which gets converted into a deeper dialogue type frame. And when the output comes, it's in a frame again, which goes again through a speech synthesis system into a speech wave and comes out again. And the frames sort of look like this, where you can say, I will move from here to there. You can see there's a speech act of asserting by the doctor of content is an um, action, which is a move by the doctor from here to the destination there in the future. And if you say, I will move the clinic, the clinic is changing. And if you say, I will not move, then a polarity goes in negative. And if you say, I may move, then the polarity goes in potential. I, you may move the village and so forth. I will move to the village is now the speech act has become an order. So you see, you, you can play. You can design your own little language like this, just like I showed you before. And a lot of the work goes into designing a clever, good little language that can capture the meaning adequately. Then you have to worry about prosody, and here's another little thing I would like to show you, but this is just looking at the speech wave. So there are these funny graphs, there's four of them. The top one, on the top left, it shows you the, lo the loudness, and then below that is this funny sort of stripe lines, that's something called a Fourier transform that looks at the wave that comes in and breaks it up into lots of little uh, separate descriptions of different wavelengths and the strength of each little wavelength. And there are people who read the stuff they can read and they say a s sound. If you look in the middle of that one, you see sort of a black line that goes up and down very high. That's a s. There's a lot of, of ranges. It makes noise. And when there's all white, there's no sound. And so you can say s they all have their own particular picture on this, and some people can read these things. And then when you have ways of actually getting from the speech wave through the Fourier transform into something like this, you can actually then get letter combinations and go to word combinations. On top of that, you can see are people going up or down. So you can say, people say, he goes here, or he goes here. It's the same words, but that up or downness through this picture there tell you very different assertions. That's an order, and this is a question, and it's a statement, and so on. All that has to be done in order to make it. You can see the down red line, on the right the up red line. One is a, a sort of an order, and one is a sort of a he goes here, or he stays here, the type of question. All that has to be done and analyzed. So there's a lot more success stories. Information extraction, text summarization, um, and, and sentiment recognition. People now say, do they like this product, or this stock, or this something, or that, the movie, and don't they? Automatic programs are looking for words and combinations to try to build deeper structures to get to the kind of knowledge that we know are ne is needed by systems in order to exhibit some kind of intelligent behavior. But, but, but the things just don't work well enough. <laughs> no? This is an old example from machine translation. The spirit is willing, but the, vodka, the flesh is weak. The vodka is wrong, but the meat is rotten. Each thing individually is good, but the overall thing is simply just rubbish. The bottom one is a system my own group built. And you know, where do you find zebras? In the dictionary. It's true. <laughs> you go look in the dictionary, that zebras is there, right? But it's not what we mean. How do you, you know, it matched. You know, you can find zebras is one of the last words in the dictionary or some sentence like this. is find the last word in the dictionary, location, zebra, in, blah, 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 should be. Uh, and it's just wrong, right? How do you know it's wrong? Well, because it's true, right? It is a true fact. So the systems don't understand the semantics. So we have to go from words to meanings, and the problem is it's not an easy step. So let me go quickly just to show you some of the steps. You have a sentence like at the bottom, 
Sheikh Mohammed, who is also the defense minister of the United Arab Emirates, announced at the inauguration ceremony, we want to make Dubai a new trading center. And you can run a little engine to say, oh, the first thing is a proper name and a name and then a pronoun and then a verb and then a, some, some kind of adverb and then a, 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 the is a, an article to, a determiner. That's very easy. You can do this about 96% correct for English and many languages. Then you have what's called a parser, and you build a little tree structure like this, and you can do this about 92% correct for English. And that's pretty good today, that sort of thing. You say, well, on top of that, I can find all the things that are names. There's like the Sheikh Mohammed is one, and who is another one, and the defense minister is another one. So these are either places, or people, or organizations, and I can find all of them. And now I can actually go and to find the links between them, and I put them in, and I can find out information from a database or Wikipedia about them there, and that's not so hard to do. And I can find, through using some complex rules, and that becomes more difficult, is Sheikh Mohammed the same guy as the who? And the who is the same as the defense minister, and the United Arab Emirates is the same as we, and so on. That's called co-reference resolution. That works around 70, 80 percent for different languages, different kinds of complexity. And you can get that sort of reasonably out. And now you can go to these little frame structures I showed you and say, given all that information, I can create an announce frame. That's P0. Sheikh Mohammed is announcing something called P9. And what is P9? Well, it's a wanting. Who's the agent of the wanting? P6, it's we. And what is the theme of the wanting? What do they want? P10. What is the P10? A making. What is the thing that's made? Dubai, and the result is a center. Literally, this says we want to make Dubai to be a center, but it's not like in the sense of we mean it. It's like a making. What the hell does that making mean? So this is a very stupid little unpacking, but it's the beginnings of an unpacking. Later we go more, right? You have to define what these words mean. You have to define what these relations are, and you do all that sort of work. And that we cannot yet do in my field. We can do this at core, simple levels, but we get terrible performance in the 20s. 20%. Then you have other structures you can do, like what is in the front and what's the focus and so forth, and that, that you can, nobody can do that yet. And then you get a deeper representation, which nobody can do, nobody even knows how to design it, where again, there's a say action by the sheikh of the theme P9, which is a desire to do what? To do P10, which is to change the state of this thing Dubai from, I don't know what it was, the question mark, but the new state is P11, and the new state is that the essence of Dubai will be some kind of center, right? That's getting more to the true spirit of the meaning you want, and nobody, nobody knows how to define this level of language, so we simply can't do it. And that's not all yet. Then we come on top with all these things about this is a newspaper article and has a certain truth value and a certain kind of people who speak this way and so forth and so on. And then you get something approximating the whole picture of what that sentence is trying to tell you, written down in a series of layers that you can take and decompose and recompose and sort of say, okay, now I begin to understand what this is about in a sort of systematic way that I can measure. You see how hard this is? Once you start doing something that you think is easy, any child can do. This has taken about since the mid of 1950s, when computers were new, to get to this point, 60, 70 years almost. And that's, we can only do halfway up this pipeline, up to the sort of 70% level, and then we get lost. We simply can't do it yet. So if you say, I want to use language to understand what I am as a human being, the message is not very optimistic at this point. I can do a lot of things. You use Google every day. You can talk into the telephone and have the, th the thing answered with the NS NL. You can talk to it, right? And you can get question answering and stuff like that. That's through speech recognition. You can do question answering and beat the Jeopardy game. You can go and get automatic summaries of many texts into one short little summary. You can do a lot of useful things. But it doesn't mean the computer can understand. Because you cannot decompose into these sorts of structures and more. And so when I look at this, and I look to my father, and I look to Hendrik Devard, and they say, OK, what have you learned about what you are? I have to say, you know, I've had a lot of fun. <laughs> and I've had the privilege of meeting a lot of very interesting and lovely people around the world, students and colleagues and everyone. And it's been wonderful to just explore a little bit about what happens when you try to unpack the mystery and the beauty of language, but I cannot go to you, and much less to Thomas Aquinas, and say, I believe I know how to understand who I am by taking this 
think language, which I believe is a good window into how you think better than some other languages, other methods to show how you think, like brain images or things. They don't tell you much about how you think. And say, okay, I can go and explain to you, but not just talk a story like a philosopher would, but explain and give you numbers and show you things and make a computer system do that. That would constitute, in my view, real understanding that would satisfy Hendrik de Waard and my father. I cannot do that. I cannot even go to Thomas Aquinas and tell him properly that I think this is a responsible picture of the whole story of how you think and what it's all about, because I can't make that blue box. So I have to say that when one enters into a discussion about what are we and how do we know what we are, you end up always having a philosophical dilemma Am I going to stay in the world of philosophy and then I can invent all kinds of things and I can say lots of stories and make wonderful erudite theories and I can, I can have a great time, and be, but it's not provable. Or I can go and be a scientist and talk straight and honest to Hendrik and say, please, Professor Devard, please, this is all I can do for you, but I can prove it. 92%, 96%, 81%, 62%. <laughs> I think he would be happy with that answer. Because as far as I know, I didn't know him, but I've seen photos and I heard about him. He would be delighted to say, let's go and do something about this. And he would go in and start working on it. No, and I think, I hope that you feel maybe in your own heart a little bit of enthusiasm and say, yeah, that would be cool. If I had a lot of time and if I was sort of in a stupid mood, I would go and work with them for a little while. Why not? No? <laughs> that would be nice, I think. That would be really nice if we can push this forward to help computers to understand better what language is and how to work with language and out of that to begin to model what then emotions are and what you know feelings are behind that because again you're going to find the same thing you're going to have to write create an abstract language of symbols and combination rules and build on top of that rules of inference and, and, and you know when you see these words or uh, these emotions and then you can infer those ones and you have to then model what do I see in the world, what do I see in the computer, can I make it correspond 60%, 40% and only then if you can do that can you come responsibly and say I have a theory of emotions because a theory when it's all stripped down and all the fancy words are gone away is a set of terms about a complex phenomenon with a set of rules that govern how these symbols work whether it's about language or emotions or anything. And I don't think anybody can do that today. I don't care how many books they write about it. I've never seen simple sets of rules where these can be modeled on a computer. So I have to say, when I look in the theme of this from understanding language to understanding us, I realize how little of language I can understand. I can begin to quantify words, but not even concepts. So I really cannot say I understand anything about understanding language. And so understanding myself, even less. So you're fallen back, you have to fall back as a conclusion on something which is actually quite comforting. I find it much, much easier to enrich my understanding about people from having a wife and having children and so on. They teach me a lot more <laughs> than this study does, but I'm not able to put it in words. But I am able to feel that I understand something more about who I am by looking at how people around me, especially my students, act. So that's what I'm going to do from now on. I'm going to have fun with this, but I'm going to interact with people on that side, and they're going to teach me about what, lang what I am and so forth, and I'm going to learn a little bit of what language is, and I'll have fun with computers, and maybe, maybe one day Google strikes me too, and then maybe I make some money on this as well, and then everything is fine and happy. <laughs> so I want to say thank you very much for listening so carefully. I have a lot more. This is half of the talk, but I don't want to bore you. If you want to sit, I can do some more, but, but it's... I think this, this gives you, I hope, a flavor of what we do when we do natural language and how we try to be scientifically responsible to our to society who funds us and to our honest truth about what is language and what are we. And not bullshit too much in terms of just talking. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
um, about the game that you showed us for the soldiers that were going to Iraq. Did it work to make people nicer? No. <laughs> <laughs> there was another a pr prior game which was quite fun. It was pretending to be in Bosnia. So you pretend, you're sitting in this room and everything is kind of shaking and then you realize you're in a big lorry and you come up through the little village and there's this little car is smashed into another army vehicle and the smoke is coming out and the mother holds her little boy and she's rawr, rawr, rawr. she's crying in Serbian or something and you come there and, and you hear on the radio there's, there's smoke far away and they say come help us come help us we're under attack we need you and here's this mother in the road and she looks at you and she says help my boy she says what do you do do you go past her and go help your friends and then you leave and then there's an international incident? Or do you stop here and help her and get the hospital and the helicopter and then your friends get killed? What do you do? <laughs> Not so easy. Now some, some of these soldiers, they sit and they think, Arr. and if you wait more than one minute, then people, new artificial people start coming out and they start screaming, yeah, American, go home, blah, blah. And then one picks up a stone and starts throwing the, the you know, artificial stones that you know, you see the stone, but they, they're on the screen, so you don't, you know. So it becomes quite pressure. So they have psychologists working on this to try to train these students. The right answer is you split your forces and two or three of them stay here. You stay there, you deploy them around in accordance so nobody will harm this spot and nobody will touch this boy and pretend to make another incident here. The Americans hurt us and stuff. And you call the helicopter and you take the rest and you go and help your friends. That's what you do. Very few of the soldiers had the mental um, capability of doing this even though they chose some of the better young officers to come, simply because they're not trained to do this sort of thinking. They just want to help this thing, Bam, let's go, right? That's what they did. So most of them failed. Because it's so expensive to do this thing, and because it's far away and stuff, they didn't have many trainees come in. So now I think the American army is using much simpler versions of this in sort of little screens that they listen to what you say and they have little little small sentences in a big vector space, you say something and it finds the most appropriate close thing and says something back to you. And it's much simpler kind of interactive training. And that they do do, and that I believe does help actually a little bit. But it's interesting, right? You wouldn't think that the American army would put a lot of money into doing this. It's, it's funny, it's surprising how, how different people understand what you can use language for and where you get the money from to do some things. It's amazing. Thank you. Any other questions? The woman there in the back. Uh, first of all, thank you for a very, very uh, interesting uh, talk. I had a question. Um, what uh, are your thoughts on things like artificial neural networks who uh, try to learn language by yeah, learning or growing uh, like a child does in a way, rather than trying to define the rules or trying to statistically uh, 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 infer the rules? Thank you, that's a brilliant question. That always comes up. Because you say, if I can train a neural network with my input thing, my sentence, and my output frame, and I say, I give you 7,000 sentences and frames, I make them by hand, and then the neural network goes up and down and learns its little numbers, and now I give it a new frame, and it combines it and says, here's a new sentence, and here's the frame. I give a frame, whoop, and there's the sentence coming. Well, that would be great, problem solved, right? I just have to design the little thing and make it. And then I say, well, let's say I could do that, and we have to ask, can we make it happen? Do I know anything about the transformations in between, or is it just a magic thing that happens to work? What, is that an adequate theory? Would you be happy if I told you, oh, I have a neural network that can do this? Would I have explained language to you in a way that would satisfy you, that would satisfy my father or Professor Devon? I could quite easily say that you don't know anything about it. You just happen to have this magic tool and it does the right thing for you and just uses this. It's like you picked it up off the street, the aliens brought it to you, you don't know what you're doing. It just happens to work for you, right? I would say, no, but I had to design the frames. They said, well, I can design other frames and it would work equally well. It just learns to do that. That's the response that I come to as a person when they tell me about the neural network problem. Now, there are people, and my own students, who love neural networks, and we constantly have this fight. I say, you don't know what the hell you're doing. You just happen to have a tool to work. They say, yeah, but it works. And your stuff doesn't work. <laughs> what must I say, right? So we now use, for small steps in some of our work, these neural networks to learn small transformations up this hierarchy of transform up this ladder here. 
but only in small enough steps that I feel, okay, I could use any statistical association program, maximum entropy, entropy and naive Bayes, any other method to do the transformation. And if neural networks turns out to be cheaper and easier, I use it. If another method gives me better results, I use that. I don't care. I don't care at the level of the algorithm what makes those steps. I care about the steps and the layers for each of them and the ways of composing at each level to get the answer right. And neural networks is never going to do that. I have to invent the steps. It cannot invent the steps. So there's my more nuanced answer. I'm happy to take neural networks or any machine learning algorithm or even a human algorithm where it's simple enough, but I still need to know what's the steps, what's the layers, What's the complexity of each layer? What can it do and what can it not do? And then, then, then only we have understanding. That's my answer. Thank you for this very clear answer, I think. Uh, yes? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, is, it even, uh, sorry. is it even possible to uh, fully model the whole language since you say we don't uh, understand this and we don't understand grammar fully? Can we model all of language, even if we cannot understand grammar fully? Do you understand when you read Elschot or someone, and your mother and your sister read him, would you say you understand the same things? No, huh? So it's not clear what full understanding would mean. You have to uh, also here give a nuanced answer where you say, I believe one can come to a simple level of this, either the simple frames or the blue box, maybe. And we'll all agree, yeah, yeah, that's in there. But then when we ask, what are the inferences you draw from this? And you see this relationship, and you see that understanding, and you see this emotion, and the other one says, oh, I didn't see that. Probably you're right, and well, we can argue about it. Then understanding becomes a very fuzzy thing. At right? the middle, you can measure it, but then it goes out in all kinds of ways. I believe, ultimately, we will be able to get that blue box, and even higher. That I believe we can do. But further than that, to get to touch those things that touch us as human beings in our heart, in a real deep essence of, of what do we really have the mechaful, the feeling of really getting us. And I don't think, I don't believe today that a computer can do that because it doesn't have the same set of endocrinal you know, glands and hunger. It doesn't know what it means to be cold. Those are just sort of symbols for it. So some of those things you can model, but I think many of those things you will not have, and so it will be much, much more difficult to give convincing, convincing answers that you can get sort of understanding at that level. But simple levels of understanding, like simple question answering, yes, I believe we can do. We will be able to do. Yeah. And that would be enough to give some kind of understanding of what we are, I think, some kind of nice story of how we work, we can model things, we can get effects like my computer program that refuses to say anything, surprisingly. We'll get more and more of them, yeah, as we put different language engines together in one bigger complexity. But I don't think we'll get something that will really interest us with its deep sense-making poetry or its novel or a play about some human dilemma that captures us. That I don't think we'll get. No. Thank you. Um, to ask a question myself, to go on on that, can you not emulate like human feelings instead of like having yes. computer understand it? Can you not just like trick it in, or trick us in that it understands us? Like Eliza, I believe a, super, a very sophisticated Eliza thing. I believe yes, we can. I believe that if you give me any regular phenomenon, where it's a set of behaviors based on a set of inputs or a set of some things which give you a set of outputs, if you give me enough of that. Good examples where there is a systematicity, where I can give to people and they will say, yeah, this all fits and it makes sense, and they give me the same answers. I can build a computer machine learning algorithm that will model that. Maybe not exactly the same level that people will model, maybe 10% less usually, depending on how you measure. But I believe we can emulate emotions. If you give me these and these words in these and films, I will say, I am angry. If you give me those words to say, no, I am sad. Yes, I, I believe we can do that. The question is, when I open the box and I show you the layers and you say, well, I mean, you're just looking at word combinations and you call this understanding, you will be very disappointed. And I will feel like a, 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 a magician who did this magic thing and I say, see, this is what I'm doing. And you say, ah, okay, you know, that's the feeling very much in artificial intelligence, very often. So I don't want to hide anything. I say, this is what I do, right? So simple, some things and so beautiful, so elegant that you can do those. 
So the, 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 the tricking, even you can emulate and you can pretend to have emotions and pretend to have goals and pretend to have plans for things and, and, and you can make systems that actually operate this way. You can train these American soldiers or you can act as if you understand them. But behind the scenes, it's always a series of layers of abstraction with rules of combination in between them. That's always what it is. And that's not enough, I think, to convince anyone that there's real understanding in there. But it's a question ultimately of you. You have to say, what do I believe is a true explanation? Am I willing to say this is a real explanation? This is really thing thinks, it feels? Or is it just a simulation? And eventually, when we have clever enough artificial uh, machines to go in the far future, it may be the case that we say, yeah, hey, it acts like a human, it smells like a human, it thinks like it talks like a human, I'm going to say it's human. And on that final note, I would like to mention, in NEC, the Japanese large electronics company, about 15 years ago, I saw a demo. They had built a small little white furry thing, like a little rabbit without legs and ears. And it sat there, and they gave this to elderly people, and it had a motion sensor in there and two big plastic eyes and a little noise thing inside. And it sort of motion, it, it had a little sensor, which uh, a little radio link to some control, some control thing in, in, in the old age home somewhere. So that if it sat there and it was in the room with the elderly person, and the person had not moved for three, four hours, it made an alarm. It said, come look here, there's something wrong here. So they gave this little thing to lots and lots of people living in this home. And they showed us a video of one old lady who came. She said, now, if you came in, it said, hmm, 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 you know, I was happy to see you. And then uh, if you didn't do much, it, said, mm, mm, it made little noises like this, just like we would think as, you know, like a child. And at one point, the, the little old lady, they were interviewing her, and she said, I love this thing. I said, why? She said, it, 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 re it responds to me. It's nice to me. She said, but you know, it's only a tool. It's only, yeah, she said, but it's more responsive than my husband ever was. <laughs> <laughs> now, did she, did she know this? Was, of course she knew this was a thing. And yet she had the connection to it. That's where we're going to be in you know, 100 years from now, exactly in this dilemma. Thank you. Any other questions? The gentleman in the back. Yeah, Ed. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question. A lot of us have been following AI for many years, and we viewed the defeat of Kasparov by, the, uh, machine, by Big Blue, a major milestone in artificial intelligence. And although it wasn't announced with the same sort of fanfare, defeating the human champion Jennings in, in Jeopardy, that was also a major uh, milestone. People showed that you can get enormous amounts of in information out of texts. I have two questions, may, and they may... Um, complement each other. One is, what's the next milestone? And two, if you don't want to answer that one, if it were up to you, what would you define as being the next big challenge in AI? Whoa. Trust John to ask a difficult question. After the Jeopardy thing, the press asks this question all the time. What's the next milestone? And then no matter how many times you say, well, every 10 years, you know, milestone, a breakthrough in different areas, and the, the chess thing is a sort of an artificial constrained world, and the language thing, it's a game, but it's a little bigger and so harder to do, but, to, you know, and stuff. Then you say, in the same trend, where do you go next? So is it robots that, that can act closely enough and simulate us in a certain constrained setting well enough that we like it, that we, we get fooled by them? Is it some language engine that puts together all the language technologies and gives you answers to questions and tells you what to do and reminds you of things and stuff like this? I don't think any of this would constitute for me a milestone. I have no idea where the next milestone will be, but I will tell you that anybody who says he knows, I don't believe him. That's, that's completely clear. Where I would personally like to go, I want to go and build that blue level. And I believe, I firmly believe in my heart, that if I can build that blue level well enough, and the rest of the talk was all about how to build that blue level using large, very large sets of computers on large, large, large sets of, of text and making inter internal representations and statistics over them. I would love to build that internal level and allow and build rules for composing little pieces of this to get not just one thing, but when you tell it one thing, 
it says, oh, you've told me this, and I know this, and this, and this, I'm going to put them to you, oh, now I know this. But if this is true, then oh, now I know this. And, and have a machine that you make one sentence, and it goes in ways, and thinks for 10 minutes, and comes back with 700 questions. Say, I want to know this, and I want to know this, and I want to know this. And have the whole fringe of questions just so waiting. And you say, okay, I'll tell you this thing. Oh, thank you very much. And it comes back and says, now I have 200 more questions. That, to me, would be a big breakthrough, because out of that, you'll have a machine that can teach itself, as we talked about this afternoon. You will have a machine that can teach others, can guide them, say, here's the interesting questions, not can teach others, and so on. You will have this self-cyclic, reproducible thing that will break through so much, which is so hard to do today. And so I'm working all my speed, as hard as I can, to try to do that. And I think that sort of burning passion is what people should have in their life, no? I think Professor Devart had that, right? And I, I see how people admire him, and I would like to, to carry that spirit through and give it to my students too. And I believe you do too, in fact, with your work. That's exactly what we should be doing. Thank you. And then there was a question from the gentleman there. Yeah, well, I, I had a question about uh, Watson you showed us. Um, isn't it uh, already doing a little bit like you just mentioned that it's, uh, it, it comes back with questions, you put in information, it comes back with questions, so it narrows uh, outcomes down and you can have uh, a more reliable answer. Isn't that what's going on with Watson already? Part of that, they didn't show that in the game, but inside it works that way, yes. It does generate many, hundreds of thousands of hypotheses and rank them, and you can treat each hypothesis as a question, saying, I believe this is true, is that the case? Or, I believe this is true, but it rests on the following two facts, both of which I see in my knowledge, but they're, they're not very strongly attested, or they, they said only four times in my text base, or one guy said this and two guys said the opposite, and I'm not sure what to, right? So you can rephrase each of these hypotheses as questions, and as soon as you give it the answer to that, that goes back in, and other things become unlocked. So it's not that far in that sense from what, what I'm describing, but, but it's in a very constrained setting, and it only deals with certain kinds of factual knowledge of the kind that they give in the Jeopardy game. It doesn't deal anything with the kinds of things that concern us. How do I make sure my children grow up happy? Right? How do I make sure I don't lose my job in this bad economy? What's causing this bad economy? You can't ask Watson those questions. It has no idea, right? But you can ask any student, any high school kid, those questions, and they'll have a theory. It may be wrong, but they'll have a theory. They will have thought and be able to compose little mental structures around that. I want to be able to do that, and that uses some of the Watson capabilities, but it goes more, it has more sophisticated patterns of combination, and that's not so easy to build. I don't know how to learn those patterns. So it would be nice to learn these elemental frames and then patterns of composition of frames on top of them. That would be the game, no? Wouldn't that be great? Then you can talk to this bloody thing, and it, it asks you questions like any four-year-old who irritates you. It's constantly asking questions, and you just tell it as much as you want. But it'll go to the web and ask the web questions, and everybody will sit there and teach this machine. Imagine, imagine, no? Wouldn't that be cool? You'd have this web intelligence that is growing by everybody's input. Like Wikipedia is a static thing, this would be a dynamically growing thing. Wouldn't that be cool? Please say yes. I think it would be really cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we have time for one final question. First of all, I'm utterly unqualified to ask this question, but um, from my understanding, you have very many primitive components which interact in a way um, that gives you kind of a complex system that, that from which language emerges. Would that be more or less correct? Uh, modulo, yes, sure, yeah. Well, if, if such a system has a lot of nonlinear um, feedback systems, like for example, the, the word pronounced differently or a slightly different word could cause dramatic differences in what it actually expresses, then I think such a system, especially given the capacity that our language has and all the rules that we have, would very um, fast would, would very fast to become chaotic. Yes. And such a chaotic system, I think in other fields it's been shown, is difficult to predict. It can be managed in some cases, but it's extremely difficult to predict. So aren't you in some way um, trying to predict chaos? 
that's too erudite for me and it makes me a little uncomfortable because I, I think it's, it's, the assumptions are good, but it's playing games on words like chaos. It is the case that you have a lot of independent modules. It is the case that they influence one another. It is the case that sometimes small changes can have large effects. It is not, however, the case that these can just explode out because you and your brain, all those things are true of you and your brain, and you don't explode out. We don't suddenly go catatonic and, ah, like this. Very few of us do, you know, for more, unless it's LSD. So there are dampening effects too, and I think there's a sort of a, an attenuation curve. As you go out on this curve of thinking about something and thinking, you just simply, it gets too complex or you get tired or something. Something dampens your, your craziness out, and when you take some drugs or something, maybe you go further, but you still dampen down. You don't go into a spiral. Now, it may be the case that you could build a computer program that would go in a spiral, but I think anybody, Jeopardy, people, Watson or anyone, when you, when you start dealing with hundreds of thousands of, of competing elements, that, you, that each one of which can cause recombination and go crazy, there's naturally some kind of ranking in them. That you, you, since you're running on a, on, a, on a cluster, maybe a hundred or maybe a thousand computers, you can't go and think about everything all the time. So the natural thing as a computer scientist to do is to put a ranking and to put some kind of attenuation factor. If you're not clever on this, of course you may explode. In fact, in 1977, the Ichikai Artificial Intelligence Best Computing Prize for the best thesis that year was given to Chuck Rieger, who wrote a program, a computer program, who worked on these conceptual dependency things, who did an inferential explosion, they call it. You gave it a sentence, it instantiated things, it had rules to instantiate more, they had rules, and they did this, and they expanded, and they filled up all the memory available, and it just froze. And for that, he got the prize then, because he showed this. So yes, if you're, if you're not careful, you can do that sort of thing. But it doesn't mean chaos. It just means sort of blind recursion and growing. So if you call that chaos, yes, chaos. But if you call that sort of, um, I call that just not being careful and, and sort of guiding cleverly what it is that you do. And anybody who, who does this sort of work, you and I and anybody who does this work, would say, yes, of course we can get that. And the non-linearity could, could make that happen. But we will design our systems that they sort of self-correct just because we don't want to run into chaos all the time, into the sort of freezing all the time. So I, I'm not afraid of that, even though it might happen. Yeah. OK, let's thank the speaker again for his great story. Um, um, if you can come down for a sec. Um, we are very honored that uh, although you have affiliations all over the world, actually the professor not only works in the United States, but also in China at two universities, uh, at South Korea and at Canada, you took some time, some days to come to Groningen and tell this great story. Um, we brought you some uh, presents on behalf of uh, uh, Studium Generale, Science Links and us. First of which is a special canister with uh, hands uh, delicacies. I hope you like them. <laughs> Second of all is something to remind our university forever. <laughs> Thank you. A third of all is especially also from Studium Generale, which is something if you at some time also still read paper books to keep a bit of track of them. Thank you very much for organizing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Then, um, Mevrouw de Baart wants to say a few words, I believe. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ed Hovey. I'm very happy to have finally met you. I heard so much about you from my daughter. And though I didn't understand much of your talk, but that's <laughs> your fault. Not your fault, it's mine. I'm too old for this. But what I did understand, what I got, is that no matter how ingenious and cleverly designed a computer program is, it can never completely match the human brain. And, um, and this is good news for people like I have two daughters who are professional translators. <laughs> they will always be needed because as you showed, meat and uh, flesh. We have one word for it, flesh but they, meet complete, they mean completely different things. There are other examples, lend and borrow, teach and learn. And I find, uh, will finish with one 
other finally which have we have the word the word geluk in Dutch it means luck and happiness and luck and happiness are two entirely different concepts so I'm very happy that we are lucky enough to have the members of the and like the web board who organize this lecture every year it takes time energy and doesn't know hundreds of emails <laughs> to put it all together <laughs> thank you boys you did a great job <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Paula. I go stand here, as I believe most of you can hear me this way too, and I actually have to change something. <laughs> Which, uh, where's your microphone here? Uh, yes? Oops. There it goes. Um, this lecture was made possible uh, due to a number of sponsors, which you see uh, on the slides here. Um, I'd like to thank all of them, and in particular our study association, FMF, for loyal support throughout many years. Thank you, guys. And also, thank you this time for uh, artificial intelligence. Let's try this one. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, uh, uh, computational linguistics for support of this lecture. Then, um, the next Hendrik de Waard lecture will be in many months, however. Our associate studium generale has some um, two nice lectures coming up next week. Um, I think most of you know Albert Einstein, but uh, Richard Feynman actually was of equal size, of equal importance, and is sometimes called the greatest physicist of the 20th century, doing a lot about quantum mechanics and so on. Next week, Monday, there will be a special lecture about everything Wikipedia doesn't tell you about this famous physicist, who worked very hard to, like, uh, has his own lecture series teaching complete of physics, but to the outside world, he did like he was like a, a ladies' man and just walking around a bit. Then, um, saying on the subject, this lecture was in Dutch. Next week, Tuesday, is a lecture in English about sex for fun. Now, most of you, <laughs> <laughs> most of you, uh, um, um, uh, uh, sex is uh, considered to be related to procreation, but if you look to like sexual behavior of people, that is not always a one-to-one -one correspondence, and the role of fun in it okay. will be explained next Tuesday, also in this building. <laughs> that leaves me with one thing to say. We have um, also a bit of fun for you, which are free drinks in the Rose Garden. Um, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>